Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami All right, friends. Um, this evening, uh, we find that we are approaching the equinox. Yeah? And whether you're in the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere that has its meaning, right? It is a time of change. You happen to be at the equator it's things are still changing um but it's going from hot and dry to maybe wet and humid or vice versa um, but it is a time of change and um this as it does every year often gets us reflecting on the nature of change and change is very important very vital very essential to what the Buddha was trying to point to, what he was trying to awaken us all to, and what he himself awoke to. Um, there are many complicated explanations that he provided for what it was he awoke to. Um, but when he first explained it to somebody else, this was what they understood, the nature of change. And that's been, you know, kind of, the quintessential teaching of the Buddha ever since. And so I'd like to reflect on impermanence in Pali Anicca tonight and invite you to uh, consider some of these ideas yourself. Um, so uh, just just to say, so you've probably, you, you've all, you know, heard a lot about Anicca, about impermanence. You've thought about it a lot. And yet we come back to it again and again. And this is one of the first and most obvious aspects of impermanence is that the insight into impermanence is impermanent. Uh, it's not enough to simply get it and have an aha moment and then we're good. The very understanding, the very knowledge, the very consideration and contemplation that things are changing slips away from us constantly. We get it and then it's gone. We get it and then it's gone. Um, and it is, it, is not, it is not the undercurrent of all thought and speech in, in, our, in society, um, but it's there a lot. You have to know where to look for it. And it's funny that you can't look for it in science and you can't look for it in philosophy. Um, you can't look for it in math. Uh, if, you, if you were like, also I was like, I commonly do with these things. If you were to, to Google impermanence and find the Wikipedia entry, you would find that the, the world and human history is divided into two camps. You have the Eastern philosophy or Buddhist camp where impermanence is a major, major teaching. And you would have the everybody else camp where everyone is kind of on the fence about it. Like it's pretty clear that some things change, but if you are aiming for an explanation of life, the universe and everything, it's pretty clear to most people that there has to be something that doesn't change. Whether you call that God, whether you call that uh, science, whether you call that math, um, there's, there are um, systemically, in terms of our society, in terms of the way we think, there, the, if you try to think big picture, you always eventually naturally end at this conclusion that something is stable, that something is permanent. And so you tend to throw out impermanence completely. Um, and uh, then you have the Buddhist teachings, you have where Anicca is propped up. But to understand that it, it's, it's not also uh, like a, a global systemic, like the, the part of the reason, if you were to, to, to do a, a, a Buddhist polycanon Google and go through the polycanon, 
for uh, references to Anicca, you don't find the Buddha saying that Anicca is a thing, that it is a god, that it is a force out there that you can look at and you can analyze and you can you can grasp. Um, instead, the Buddha is always, always framing impermanence as uh, it is a, a characteristic of things. Those things which you can look at, you can see and understand and try to grasp, those are the things that are impermanent. And the Buddha does not even uh, go so far as to say that all things are impermanent, which, what, what? yeah. But actually, there is something that the Buddha says is not impermanent, and he calls this uh, Nibbana. But um, what his, his first um, student attains the first level of awakening woke up to is that all conditioned things, all things that arise are impermanent. Anything that arises ceases. And um, because Nibbana doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have an end. But we'll maybe get back to that. Um, we'll see where the, where the night takes us. Yeah. But instead, let's, let's talk about um, change and where to look for it. So we can't look at, uh, we can't look at religion. We can't look at philosophy. We can't look at math. We can't look at science. Where do we look? We look to poetry. We look to song. Um, it, and as it turns out, that whenever people are are getting reflective, are getting um, uh, are noticing how much of a, a factor changes in our lives, uh, it is because you know they're they're seeing. You know, pretty much all all poetry, all all music, is about something has changed, something is changing something will change. Yeah, why is that? Well, it turns out that when things change, when they have changed, when they are changing, when they're about to change, we feel something. And that something is what the Buddha called dukkha, suffering. We, it hits us, right? And this is, this, and that's when people get reflective. That's when they get poetic. You know, that's when that you get these poignant, melancholy verses that 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 reach in and kind of you know, twist our emotions, right? Because change is a thing and it does something to us, right? This is a major factor in our lives. And in fact, it is the nature of our lives. And that is something that we only, again, we 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 reach for it, we touch it but then it slips back away from us, yeah? Um, because we can't hold on to this understanding, um, but we do wake up to it from time to time and we realize that that is the nature of things, is change. Change is life. It, it's the very definition of life. Uh, as, uh, and to prove that, I would say, imagine a patient being wheeled into a hospital and the doctors would like to ascertain, is this patient alive or not? So, right, they, they hook him up to all of these devices, you know, put little wires on his head and on his chest and, um, you know, oxygen meters and stuff. Now, they get a display that will tell them whether the patient is alive or dead. And is that display like, um, like the power light on a computer? Do they get a little readout that says, on, patient is alive? Brain on, a little green light. Heart on, green light. Circulation on, green light. Is that what they get? You, I mean, whether I mean, even if you've never been in a hospital, you probably have some understanding that no, what they get is monitors, little graphs, bars. They go boop, boop, boop. Yeah. So what, what is it doing? In order to ascertain if somebody is alive, you, you can't just look for a single state. What you have to look for is movement between different states. And that is the very definition of your patient is alive. Yeah? If they have breathed in and they do not immediately follow that with a breath out, your patient is dead. And if they have breathed out and they do not immediately follow that with a breath in, they are not living. Yeah, there is no 
if, if you ever have a state in the brain where there is just static electricity, not moving, not, not, not active, but just static, then your person's fried, yeah? That's, that's, not, that's, that's not good, you know, that's not thinking. That's just a chemical soup, you know, that's very ineffective, yeah? If you were to look at the, the heart, yeah? It's not, it's not just on because it has to push the blood through the veins. It has to go out to the extremities and supply oxygen and then come back. If it stops anywhere, health suffers. If it stops anywhere permanently, death. So our, our body is screaming at us, you have to change. Change is the very nature of what it means to be in this world. And yet, why, why, why is it that we even need to talk about this if it's so obvious, if it's so quintessential, if everything in nature that is, is alive is alive because it is changing and moving from one state to the next? Why do we even have to talk about this? Well, is that rather than looking at what we've been given, what, what we're this sort of neat popsicle that we're, you know, walking around in. Um, look at the things that we create, yeah, to get a reflection of not how things are, but how our mind actually works. The things we're given change, but the things we create, are they created to change? Yeah? Was this created to change? Or is change a failure state? Oh, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. The, the, I mean, little little gizmos and stuff, the stuff that's powering our our modern life. Is it important that they change? Yes. They have power running through them. We want them to know when they're when we want the mouse to tell the computer when it's being moved across a surface, right? But when we think about that mouse, do we, do we want it to be like a living mouse that's, that's moving and eating and defecating and pursuing its own path? Or do we want it to be a mouse that sits there on our desktop until we move it? Do we want it to stay the same? Do our, our phones and our computers and even our microphones and refrigerators now, um, when they suddenly get a service update, and all of the little buttons that we got used to change. Do we like that? Do we feel that? Is that visceral, right? It's like, no, now I've got to stop and relearn how this thing works. And in fact, this is what the Buddha is pointing to. This is the very nature, not of our bodies, but of our minds. Right? Our bodies have to change. Our minds are devised around the principle of not change. They, they seek for and thrive on tangible static entities. And yeah, it, it, because that is not how things work in reality. <laughs> Suffering is born, right? And so, so here we are. This is what we're looking at and what we're, we're looking for in the world. And this is the source of our greatest inspiration in Buddhist practice is um, peeking, prying, probing into the nature of our minds and repeatedly asking ourselves, like, how am I relating to the things in front of me? Am I open to their change? Am I accepting other change? Do I even recognize their change? Yeah. And when we find that something in our lives changes, um, this is our opportunity for practice. This is our opportunity to really, you know, get, you know, take our Dhammic pulse and figure out how much, how much have we really internalized? And this applies to everything, not just, not just the, 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 the clothing and the electronics and the cars, um, but food in, in our refrigerator, yeah? It doesn't stay the same, does it? You can't just put it in there and bring it out three months later and you're good to go. No, most of those things are, you know, they just, they're not gonna last that long. They're going to go through 
transitions. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, today I've been, you know, painting in the monastery, even, you know, paint on a building, on a wall that is not being touched, is not being interacted with. It will fade. It will change color over time. You paint the wall. And if you go back to paint it with the same paint a month later, they are two different colors. The one you're applying and the one that you previously applied are no longer the same because once it hit that wall, it started to change. Yeah. But how does that make us feel? Would we rather have the wall, you put one coat of paint on it and it stays that color? Yeah. Would we rather have the wall just stay? Yeah. What, how does it make us feel when things start to, to break? When animals chew holes in things, when rain drips in through a, a leak in the roof and you've got these big spots, yeah? How does it make us feel when, you know, the, all of the structure around us changes? But why should that be the case? Why should that be the case? We, if we were to go out into the forest, something that we have not exerted our control over, would we find anything that is static and stable and dependable and reliable and unchanging? No, no. I mean, if you've ever spent the night in the forest, you probably have experienced what I experienced every single night I have ever stayed in the forest and that something will die and it will hit the ground very loudly somewhere near you. And it will wake you up to the reality of things are dying. Yeah. You will hear, hear a scream at some point of the, the, you know, dusk or the middle of the night or dawn, you know, something has become food and something has eaten. Yeah. Uh, but this is, this is change. This is death. You know, the squirrel that used to occupy the place in that tree, that was his dominion. He would bark at you if you got close. He was protecting his 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 acorns. Um, just like that. That will never be the case again. Yeah. So how do we transition? How do we transition from our tangible world, like the, the setting, you know, behind me? Everything is square. <laughs> Everything is solid. Everything is mathematically precise. Uh, the calendar on the wall, yeah? Dates are, you know, they're just, they're there, yeah? Or are they, right? You know, you, you, are they the same everywhere on the planet? Does everybody agree to the way time works, yeah? Or is, is it really, is it just in our minds that this is the structure of things? Uh, how, do we, how do we make that transition? Well, first thing is that transition is what we're doing. Yeah, and we will see this in meditation. Uh, the best meditation sub subjects are those things which embrace change, right? Uh, if we're looking at the nature of the body, we're directly paying attention to change. If we're, paying, if we're doing mindfulness of death, then we're thinking about how something that is alive will not be alive. You know, what is that but change? If we are practicing loving kindness, we, we have to accept that the person we are thinking about kindly and lovingly is outside of our control. And isn't it interesting that that makes them more beautiful? Uh, it brings joy to the heart. Yeah, and if we're if we're doing uh, what some of the most basic uh, meditation subjects like um, mind, mindfulness of breathing, yeah, or doing a mantra, then uh, changes the very nature of it. Yeah, we are not doing it right if we are looking for a static state. You know, we we repeat the mantra first verbally and then in our head, and then we listen for the space in between. And then we say it again and we listen for the space in between. You because because the very nature of our speech, right? And the very nature of Vitaka Vichara, the application of our minds, is that we can apply it, but then we have to let go to be able to apply it to something new. We can't make it stick on one thing. 
is the essence, the movement of our mind is the definition of, it's not just life, but thought, right? You don't say somebody is thinking if they're going breath, 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 breath. We don't call that thought. You know, they have, there has to be a pause where they're experiencing that very breath, right? And that's, that's what we would call thinking. That's what we would call meditation. So, so this ability to uh, feel change yeah, uh, is, is huge, is life-changing in some ways, though it slips away. Uh, how profound is this experience? Well, that's, that's part of why often this teaching can feel a little ephemeral is because we don't often contact it in its full intensity, yeah? Uh, when a person does, they, it's something that kind of sticks with them a very long time. Sort of like when somebody has a, a near-death experience, right? What do they do? They think about it, it changes them, right? They think about it for a long time. It's the same thing when we really grasp impermanence, when we really touch that uh, in a way, not not like, oh, Wow, little little headphones are impermanent. These these are they're already broken. They're going to break someday. Oh, I get it. But like when we're we're really shaken to our core, we're like there's 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 like it's all moving, it's all flowing, and we realize there's that letting go. It can only happen um, through a profound letting go. And what do we call it? We call it like a flow state. Yeah, we call it being in the now. You can write a book on it. You can make millions. Why? because it's what we all want. It is the definition of release and happiness. And yet it is so hard to get because you can't get it by looking in one place. You only get it through a profound release, a profound letting go. Yeah, that is the only time it happens. But when it does happen, when we do have that flow state, that being in the now, we will, we will think back to that and reference that forever but what what have we attained really but a moment of being natural a moment of actually being ourselves of accepting i need to change to live uh, that change is the definition of success and thriving yeah being able to flow from one state to the next this is what all music and poetry is um trying to say, yeah, yeah. And that's why it tugs on us so profoundly because it's trying to lead us to that place. But the thing is very interesting. We, we, we took the precepts, right? Well, that's because when you begin to understand what the source of that um, poignancy, that really power that that change has on our psyche when we embrace it, um, you know where to look for it. You don't, you don't have to think about how you just, you just lost somebody in your life or how your, your country is changing states, you know, moving from one political party or ideology to the next. You don't have to think about how you were in a relationship and how that relationship has changed. You don't have to look at the, the minutia, the little details of your life and see how they're changing. You can, you can actually just like you know, sort of like row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, you realize that you are, you are flowing and you just let go into it, yeah? You just, you just let life move. And in that moment where you're actually doing it, you've stopped existing. And when you, you stop existing, and that's what the Buddha calls anatta or not self, because you're, again, you can only be there if your mind is putting you there. Because if you look at the reality of things, everything's changing. There is no you to point to. But when you stop putting yourself there, then there is nobody there to suffer, right? The definition of what a self is, is something static. The definition of what is static is suffering, yeah? The inability to change, yeah? So here we have why the Buddha points to these characteristics is they're, they're tied together. And when one goes, the other tend to go with it. Yeah, um, And that is sort of how we, we make this transition. Yeah, The Buddha is often putting them together. And he says it 
Uh, he says it one way in a famous uh, set of Dhammapada verses. He says, um, all conditioned things are impermanent. Uh, when one sees this with true wisdom, they lose an interest. They, they nibindati, they cool to suffering. Yeah, and that this is the path to purity. Uh, you can see this as a negative thing, just a letting go, a releasing, or you can see it as a positive thing, embracing nature, you know, actually just diving into this flow of life and saying, hey, I'm not going to cling to anything. I'm just going to let it change. And this, this is a scary thing in some ways. And so you shouldn't beat yourself up if it doesn't, you know, you just can't, can't okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be in the now. Um, it's it goes against our nature completely, yeah, and that's that's probably the greatest source of wisdom is not to to wake up to the fact that things are impermanent because of course we're all trying to do that that's what we're we're told to do right, but waking up to the fact that we can't just do that that our very mind is structured around suffering is structured around not changing yeah. And so the thing that we, the tool that we are using to try to understand impermanence is trying to be permanent all the time and is based on trying to think of things in a permanent way. And in order to really get it, we have to let go of that very mind. We have to let go of our body. We have to let go of our lives and let them be what they're going to be. So that's a little crazy, yeah? <laughs> but again, um, the Buddha... Uh, um, in some ways, we could say that this is uh, the highest form of, of happiness. This is the very definition of happiness. In one uh, notable teaching, the Buddha, um, you know, previously we were talking about merit. And um, we, we said that an easy way to think of merit uh, that the Buddha offered is happiness, right? So what, what is the, um, the amount, uh, the, the relationship of, of the happiness that is generated from certain things? And the Buddha said, imagine you spend your entire life giving gifts and offerings and oblations to worthy people, to the Sangha. Um, that, would be, that would be an incredible amount of generosity and joy and happiness and gratitude, right? Now think of an entire life of doing that, you know, being rich and just, just helping people left and right and center, yeah? That'd be an incredible amount of happiness, yeah? And the Buddha uh, equates that to um, experiencing the pure heart's release of true loving kindness, having your mind completely purified of all um, sense desire and hatred for the time it takes to milk a cow or a goat for that matter. Um, to just for that period of time, have an actually pure heart free of any animosity or clinging um, would be the same amount of happiness, an entire lifetime of all that gift giving, yeah? But the Buddha says, if you were to actually experience that flow state, that being in the now, that, that perfect release of, you know, anicca, dukkha, anatta, you've stopped existing, you have stopped suffering, you, have, you are experiencing nature as it actually is and seeing it as it actually is. If you were to experience that, even for the time it takes to snap your fingers or um, have one in-breath and out-breath, then that would be equivalent to the pure heart for the time it takes to, to milk a cow or for the time, or for an entire life of gift giving, yeah? That's how much happiness it would be. But because the Buddha doesn't, you know, the only, the next measurement is to, to having seen that impermanence, you then attain stream entry. And the Buddha says, well, you can't even measure the happiness of that, yeah? To be permanently free of rebirth in all uh, woeful states, to be permanently free of any notion of permanent self, yeah? to be completely free of samsara in no long time, just, just a couple lifetimes, six or seven, no more. <laughs> um, you, you can't, that's impo it's impossible to calculate how much happiness that would be, yeah? The only actually calculable amount of happiness we can, we can measure by how much of an effect it has on our culture and our society. 
when somebody gets even a little drop on their tongue, they will talk about it for the rest of their lives. And we will throw money at them to keep doing it, yeah? <laughs> because it will be the catchiest tune. It will be the most awe-inspiring, you know, poetic verse if they could encapsulate that and get us to even glimpse it, right? So that is, that is what we're going for. You know? That's what we're looking for. That's what we're doing. Yeah? And so I hope um, some of these reflections help encourage you. Yeah, This is not a dry practice. This is a happy practice, a practice of letting go, a practice of embracing. Yeah. So um, yeah, you know, yeah. If you if you can, you know, hear this and then get up and start to look at something and be like, oh, what what would it be like if I was okay with this changing? Yeah, you don't have to break it. You don't have to, you don't have to take your mug and throw it against the wall and be like, look how free I am. Which is really, really, it's because it's it's we've each each wise person has to realize this for themselves. Yeah. Uh, it's it's not the thing. The thing is the thing is already natural, yeah. Uh, but can you synchronize with that? That is the real practice we're doing, yeah. Can you the next time something changes, the next time something that's always worked doesn't work, be it a, a joint in our body, or you know a memory that we we can't quite access anymore. Um, anything in in our in our lives and how, how how can we embrace that and we say okay and our teachers try to give us little mantras to say this is things are like this yeah this is the way things are now and that's the one that's worked for me i wake up every morning i say okay things are like this now doing that um it becomes pretty bizarre you kind of open the way to being a lot, being in all different places, you know, waking up every morning and, and wow, okay, this is where I am now. It's nothing like yesterday. But when you really understand where happiness comes from, that's, that can actually be pretty appealing. I'm I'm just going to give a plug for it, yeah? Yeah. I might be able to der derive some happiness for it from this. And if you can derive happiness from change, well, guess what? You're rich, yeah? That is a source of happiness that is pretty reliable. All right, so I offer these thoughts for your reflection this Impulse Today evening.